Welcome. Good morning. It's good to be here. I haven't, I've been out of town for a few weeks and I haven't been here and it's wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to see everyone. Alrighty. Uh, today's daily word, we're not going to be doing the daily word at this moment, but uh, the daily word is divine order. And the reading I have chosen speaks to our part in, in the divine order. I'm reading from Wayne Dyer's book, Wisdom of the Ages, and it's an essay on divinity. He is reflecting on Epictetus, a Greek philosopher born in 55 AD. If God is everywhere, then there is no place that God is not. And this includes you. Once you connect to this understanding, you regain the power of your very source. This may make sense right now, as you read these words, hear these words, but you are probably like many of us who did not grow up with this concept. A more popular image is something like this. God is a giant vending machine in the sky <laughs> in the form of a white bearded male on a throne. <laughs> Deposit tokens in the form of prayers and God sometimes delivers the goods and other times not. <laughs> this is the idea of God as separate and distinct from ourselves. <clears throat> Epictetus suggests shifting from this concept of the universe as a monarchy to understanding that you are a principal work, a fragment of God <laughs> himself. Sai Baba, is a contemporary avatar living in India who knows and practices being the divine spark of God, which is why he is a part, which is why he is a part of, and in many ways, one of which, no, sorry, excuse me, is why is he is a part of him, sorry. I edited it a little bit and that wasn't a good thing. So <laughs> let's get back on track here. So we're gonna get back to Sai Baba's experience. When a Western journalist asked Sai Baba, are you God? He gently responded, yes I am, and so are you. The only difference between you and me is that I know it and you don't. When you know that you are a divine manifestation of God, you have made conscious contact with God, and you treat yourself and others as expressions of the divine. In Rome and in Greece, this is what Epictetus was telling us 2,000 years ago. Trust in your divine nature. Never dispute the nobility of your true self, and treat yourself with the same reverence that you have for God. Amen. So our first song this morning will be Surrender All Things.
so beautiful. Beautiful, thank you. Let us pray together the prayer of Jesus translated from the Aramaic. Father, mother, birther, and breath of all, create a space inside us and fill it with your presence. Let oneness now prevail. Your one desire then flows through ours as energy fills all form. Give us this day our physical and spiritual nourishment and untangle the knots of error that bind us as we release others. Do not let appearances make us forgetful of the source, but free us to act appropriately from age to age through you. Flow the glorious harmonies of life. May these words be fertile statements through which our future grows. Amen, amen, amen. So now we come to the actual daily word, which I already shared with you. The word for today is divine order. And the affirmation is divine order supports my life. Divine order is one of the great truths of life. It provides a foundation for all growth and a blueprint for all manifestation. Feeling stuck or bewildered is a sign that I am out of step with divine order. I pause and with compassion for myself, I release thoughts of worry, impatience, and doubt. I remind myself of times when I wondered whether a hoped for result would ever happen, only to realize in hindsight that foundational aspects had to be in place first. Remembering this helps me be patient and trusting now. I affirm, I cooperate with divine order. It is established in my life now. I listen with mind and heart, trusting that I will discern my path one step at a time. And this uh, reading for today comes from the uh, proverb based on the scripture, Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. And let us all say together the, I'll say it and then we can say it together, the affirmation for today. Divine order supports my life. Let's all say it together. Divine, Divine order supports my life. Okay. Uh, Reverend Marilyn Maddox, our speaker for today, will lead us in meditation after the music team's next song, which is Lead Me to the Light. Thank you. 
let's prepare for meditation. Sweet Spirit, we are gathered here today in oneness. As we heard from Linda in the reading that God is everywhere present in every place, every space in time, above us, below us, around us, within us. And the more aware we are of that divinity and that divinity within each of us, the easier it is to accept, embrace, and love that which is different than us. So as we go into the silence today, may we open our hearts and open our minds to that which is different in this world, that we may better understand who we are as divine beings, and that that divine nature exists in every single person, whether they are friend or foe, whether we love them unconditionally or whether we consider them adversaries, they are Christed beings. And as we open our hearts and minds to the Christ within ourselves, we can better understand the Christ within others. So on this day, I asked you to pick a person, a place, a situation that may be less than ideal for you and send all the love you can to that person, place, or thing. Start with yourself and then send it out and envelop the situation in the silence. as we bring our attention to this time and this space. May we commit to holding gratitude for love, compassion, peace, and joy. And know that we can choose those attributes at any time. So this week I invite you to take all the love you have, bundle it up like a ball of warm energy and send it out to your friends, your family. Think of something that brings you joy and open your heart to that. Be open to expressing joy and feeling joy, especially if you're feeling down. So may we be peace on earth as we are the Christ presence and as we walk through this life as an expression of God. May we have the strength, the courage, and the passion to be the best Christ we can be. Namaste. Namaste. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all. It's been a while for me. I've, I've been in the house for several months, but haven't been out here. 
and I'm grateful to be here. Uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that I used to not like, the crucifixion. But we get to look at the crucifixion through the eyes of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not one of the Gospels has the entire seven last words of Jesus, but a compilation from the four, four Gospels um, has all seven of them. So in unity, we believe that Jesus is our elder brother and way shower, and that every experience he had was an opportunity to teach us. He taught us lessons and truth to help us learn our oneness in God. If we take the crucifixion literally, it's pretty ugly, it's pretty tragic. It could make you very sad. But Jesus didn't have a pity party. He kept giving us lessons throughout the crucifixion. So let's look at the metaphysics of his crucifixion. Paul Hasselbeck, a renowned um, unity minister, dean when I was in ministerial school, says metaphysics is a term for the branch of philosophy that is concerned with the fundamental nature of reality and beingness. It explores universal principles, laws, and rules that are concerned with the nature of beingness, the spiritual universe, and its relationship to the physical universe. Metaphysics is all about changing consciousness. We use principles and laws to change consciousness, to raise it from lower states to higher states. We can only consciously choose to use the thoughts, feelings, ideas, beliefs, and emotions that we're aware of. A metaphysical teaching, principle, law, or tool is fairly useless unless we can remember to use it. <laughs> Metaphysically, crucifixion symbolizes any experience in our life, which is really an opportunity to cross out any human error, limitation, or belief in separation from God. Sometimes our crucifixion will take place as a serious problem, a painful experience. Any experience which gives us an opportunity to get rid of or cross out error, limitation, or belief in separation is a crucifixion. So Jesus' crucifixion represents the final complete crossing out once and for all of all human error. We go through crucifixion daily, and we go through resurrection daily. The crucifixion that Jesus represents, that final overcoming that we shall all make someday, the final once and for all crossing out of all belief and separation. So I, I'm just going to give you a theoretical question. How many of us believe that we are one with God, that we are divine, and that we are here to be God in expression. Contemplate that in your prayer time this week. Throughout Jesus' crucifixion, he continued to do what he'd been doing all his life, teaching us lessons and truths so we could understand our oneness. These teachings that he gave us from the midst of his own crucifixion have come to be known as the last seven words. And as I mentioned, uh, not all seven are in one gospel, but it's a compilation from the four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It may look like his statements on the cross only pertain to Jesus, to his situation. Yet each statement is a lesson for each one of us, for all people. Jesus came to teach. He came to teach us lessons and truth. When we're going through an experience in life which seems to be a problem, it's really an opportunity to help us realize our oneness with God. There are seven living words, and the first one is forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Father, forgive them was Jesus' prayer for forgiveness of those who were crucifying him. He's calling upon the divinity, the wholeness, and the unconditional love of God to do the forgiving. It is the Father within that doeth the work in John 14, 10. The Father within is the consciousness of all that is good. Freedom through forgiveness is only a thought away. Our part is to say yes to it and let it perform the miracle in the right and perfect place. Forgiveness, when called upon, washes away every story, every hurt, every fear, and every belief in separation. It's transcendent and transcending. It's a spiritual practice. So how can we forgive the person that we think did us wrong? What does forgiveness do to those who we perceive have hurt us? Well, likely nothing. Forgiving sets us free. Amen. It's you and me that are the ones who get to forgive, especially when we feel betrayed or wronged or hurt. Jesus is asking that forgiveness be given from a higher place of being. In this higher place of being, we recognize and affirm that there is only good. Our human selves often can't imagine forgiving. I have a punch list of forgiveness possibilities. And today, the head of my punch list are the people who have um, engaged in the atrocities in Ukraine. We must remember that horrific things happen and they come from fear. So let's recognize the fear and not play into it. In our own lives, it's easy. It's so easy to go to victimdom. And I beg you, don't go to victimdom. It doesn't serve us. And Gary Simmons, a renowned unity minister, writes, no one and nothing or no thing is against us. Sometimes it's hard for us to see the good. Sometimes I forget to look for the good when I see so much darkness in the world. Jesus gives us a template on how to forgive, especially when our human thoughts and emotions say it's impossible. What humans have done and are doing within the collective belief system of duality, fear, and hatred is horrific. Fear can create some extreme negative manifestations. No matter what is done in fear, it does not and will not take us or anyone else out of the heart and love of God. Awful things happen death of a loved one, financial ruin. You might hear someone say, I can't forget what was done and I can't forgive what was done. It's impossible. <laughs> a little victim them there? <laughs> and yet we know that as long as we withhold forgiveness, we can never be happy. Jesus is giving us a powerful lesson in forgiveness. Forgive Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He does not say, I, Jesus of Nazareth, forgive you. The Father within you does the work. The Father is your own spiritual nature. God's spirit expresses itself through us. The Father in us can do things that our human self cannot do, especially when we get in our own way. You know those limiting beliefs and those worries and those times of self-doubt. The only thing harder than forgiving others is forgiving ourselves. We all go through this, so don't despair. Remember these words, for Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And turn the job over to God, who will do the work. Again, Jesus is telling us here that no one and no thing really wants to hurt us. But when someone does something that offends us or harms us, it's really because he knows not what he does. Lack of understanding is the real cause of human misunderstanding and mistake. 
Once forgiveness is put into action, that is, when we turn it over to God, miracles occur. Forgiveness is the greatest of all powers of which a human being is capable. There's no higher expression of love in the whole realm of human affairs than forgiveness. It will always turn error into truth, and it will turn misunderstanding into harmony, at, in, and turn misunderstanding and inharmony into harmony and understanding. Forgiveness is powerful. The second living word is, today you will be with me in paradise. And I have two sources for these, Ed Rabel and a 1962 lesson that is on divineunity.net and uh, Reverend Mark Anthony Lord, who did the Release and Renew 2021 Lent booklet last year. Jesus on the cross represents the here and now consciousness of oneness with God. And the two men being crucified next to him represent the past and the future. When we're in crisis, in the midst of transformation, Transformation, the past and the future often weigh heavily on us. Our ideas of how life is supposed to be formed from our past experiences and expectations has usually fallen apart. And the future seems dark and uncertain. In, this, in his time of crucifixion, Jesus speaks of the two men of paradise. He says, today you shall be with me in paradise. Paradise, the kingdom of heaven, it's available to each and every one of us, here, now, and always. And it can only be experienced in the now moment. When we, are, when we come from fear, we often believe that we'll lose something of value. But when we come from our faith, we know that there is never anything lost in God. Jesus' words confirm that only good shall remain. In this now moment, in the present, is where peace, love, and joy reside. Sometimes we wander in our minds. We wander into the past, wander into the future. God resides in the present moment. Wandering takes us out of the present moment. So these two thieves, one on each side, the first thief represents the past and mistakes that we dwell on. He tries to get us to remember to relive those mistakes and those unhappy moments. But Jesus ignores him. The lesson is, don't give your attention to the past. It's over and done with. The other thief represents the future and our concern for the future. He asked Jesus to remember him when he comes to his father's kingdom, and this represents our concern for the future, asking us to do something about our future right now. And Jesus' response represents the attitude we should have towards our own future and everything that concerns us in that future. The response is, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Heaven, heaven is here and now, expanding consciousness of God, not the future. And Jesus says to the second thief, I bring you into my here and now consciousness of God, which is ever expanding. And this is a good thing that we could uh, aspire to also. If we dwell in the here and now consciousness of God, and this is our prominent state of mind. When the future does come, what does it turn into? The present. Absolutely. When we handle our problems in the present, in the here and now consciousness of God, they get handled correctly. That's a lesson about our thoughts for our future. Now today, thou art with me in paradise. Third living word. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. The two people that Jesus is talking about here are Mary, his actual mother, and his disciple John. Now, John was not 
related to Mary, and Mary was not John's mother. Therefore, when Jesus said, Woman, behold thy son, and behold thy mother, he's not stating a literal fact, but he's stating a truth which is different from fact. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus had been told that his mother and his brethren were outside waiting for him. And he gives a very puzzling response to this information. He says, who then is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he says, all who do the will of my father are my mother, my brothers, and sisters. This is a lesson in human relationship that can be taken in a spiritual direction. God within connects us. Every woman is every other person's mother in reality, and every man is every other person's brother, and all men and all women are each other's brothers, sisters, mothers, sons, and daughters. In other words, we are all one. And notice, Jesus never refers to any earthly male as father. There is no such thing in truth. We're being told here once more that we are each other's mothers, sons, daughters, brothers, and sisters. And sooner or later, we will have to acknowledge this, and there will be no separation. There's only one life here of which we are all a part of. The fourth living word. Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or why hath thou forsaken me? Jesus is not trying to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me for his own sake, but for ours? He's telling something about ourselves here. He is telling us that almost every person, no matter how far advanced they may be into spiritual understanding, may still have some moments in life when they feel completely alone. Reverend Mark Anthony Lord wrote, this fourth living word is a gift that says, now it's time for a final deep cleansing of the consciousness and you are ready. As difficult as it may seem, this point in the journey is to be embraced and even celebrated. It is a sure sign that we are doing right and wonderful work, end quote. Final deep cleaning may prompt some feelings of fear or abandonment. It's so important that we don't call these feelings wrong. I invite you to move through feelings with perseverance and faith in all that is good, faith in God. We go deep within to uncover any fears or betrayals lingering. That may, we may feel some anger, we may feel despair when these remnants of untruth come up that we thought we had dealt with, let's be willing to gain some insight to deal with these untruths. Sometimes under pressure, under emotional suffering, or under negative circumstances, we can have moments of believing that we are separated from God. We don't need to criticize ourselves for having these moments because even Jesus was willing to go through voicing such a thought. Our fifth living word is, I thirst. This statement is important only when we realize that it res what it resulted in, and it resulted in a Roman soldier dipping a sponge in some vinegar and putting it on a stick and raising it to Jesus' lips so that he could quench his thirst. This is unheard of because the Roman soldiers usually try to inflict pain and encourage um, and hasten the death of someone being crucified. So metaphysically, they were doing something to help alleviate the suffering of one who is being crucified. Under circumstances that were absolutely unpromising, Jesus was able to call forth an act of kindness and mercy simply by voicing a need that he felt. We're being told something 
in just two little words, Jesus is telling us that no matter how barren of good our life may look, no matter how unpromising the outer appearances may be, if we really and truly feel a need for good in our lives, acknowledge that need and voice it. As we voice it with faith, we will attract our good. He should not have gotten that drink and that sponge, but he did because he acknowledged his need. We may say, I can't possibly get any good out of this situation that I find myself in. I can't possibly find a change for the better in this circumstance, so I won't try. <laughs> Remember Jesus' words in this situation. I thirst. I thirst for good to somehow come out of this. Voice that. Ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. But if you don't ask, don't seek, don't knock, things will remain the same. Don't be ashamed of feeling a need for good. And when you feel it, seek it with faith in God and God will take the most unlikely channel to produce the good that you're seeking. Amen. The sixth living word. It is finished. The perfection of the spiritual laws of the universe is revealed to us in Jesus' final words. It is finished means it is complete. We have put on the cross that which no longer serves us and we move on. When we consciously reach the point where our work on the cross is completed, we're aligned spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. We're powerful. In that position, when we're aligned like that, we are powerful. That which is put on the cross to be crossed out is absolutely done. Our prayers are answered. There's no space and time in God. There is only the now. Our prayers are fulfilled in the mind of God. Now that which we have crossed out is complete. So if we know what we cross out is complete and we are assured the prayer is answered, why don't we just walk forward and live confidently in our lives? Why do we still get triggered instead of setting ourselves free and letting it be? Let's say you have a garden and you have cleared away all the old weeds and overgrowth. The soil has been tilled and you have planted new seeds that will produce a beautiful garden overflowing with good. You water this garden and take loving care of it. You see the new plants breaking ground and reaching the sun. About one month later, you see some weeds start developing, cropping up here and there. You realize it's just leftover baby weeds. No harm, no foul. You simply weed again, cleaning the weeds away for even greater plant growth. When it comes to crossing out something that no longer serves us, we tend to panic when a second crop comes up. Oh my God, I thought I was done with that. <laughs> Today you are conscious of the patterns and you can choose. If it looks, smells, and feels just like the old story, call it second crop. Even if it looks, smells, and feels like that old second story. The old game is complete. Declare your good in the midst of it. The last of the seven words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' life and death were absolute demonstration of surrender, faith, and unconditional love. Surrender contains within it all the support and guidance you need for your journey of transformation. The return to God. When it comes to this final living word, we need to remember something essential. We have to live in surrender. It's not a one-time deal, although I don't know if y'all feel like I do. I wish it was. <laughs> Surrendering is a process that is infinite, and there are always deeper layers to dive into until enlightenment is reached. It can and should be a joyful experience. Ideally, we have enough of a foundation of faith and understanding to joyously let go. 
Why then does surrender feel so difficult? It's now time to own our idea of God that is so powerfully and completely for us that nothing can be against us. The relief of surrendering to God is a great spiritual practice. It's an important practice on our journey of transformation. Aren't we seeking to know God in and as our life? Our spirit is not our human personality. Our spirit is not the mood that we are in. Our spirit is not to the present condition of your physical body. Our spirit is our eternal perfect being. Always have been and always will be a perfect being in God. This being of you which is eternal and perfect, is your spirit. And it, emer it merged into all the good there is in the universe. It is God. And any time we take a moment and realize that our being is merged in the being of God, the good, omnipotent, we are, represent we are repeating in our own souls the final words of Jesus from the cross. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Or, Father, God, the good, omnipotent, regardless of how I feel, what I think, what I look like, or what I'm going through right now, I am eternally one with you and all the good that you are. I am eternally one with you and all the good that you are. Metaphysically, crucifixion symbolizes an experience in our life, which is an opportunity to cross out human error, limitation, beliefs, and separation. We know that sometimes it takes the form of a serious problem, painful experience, but any experience that gives us an opportunity to delve within and to release, surrender and release, helps us in our transformation. Our crucifixion is calling us to surrender so that we can remember the truth that within us is the greatest power of all, a divine being that is eternal and that can never be destroyed or diminished. This is the main point that Jesus was making in the story of the crucifixion. He was saying, look, take my body if you have to. You cannot destroy me. You cannot take my life from me, nor can it be taken away from you. It's time to stop playing small and pretending that there's something greater out there that, that might be bigger and better than we are. It's time to awaken to the God self within and co-create heaven on earth. There may very well have to be some crucifying of that which no longer serves us. So be it. Mark Anthony Lord writes, whether pain is pushing you or a vision is pulling you, let the mystical story be your God. Jesus' crucifixion is that mystical story. Jesus' final words from the cross are a blueprint for transformation a guide to developing our own Christ attributes and to living from a higher spiritual awareness. May you raise your consciousness with ease and grace. Namaste. Amen. Namaste. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Reverend Maddox. Um, thank you for hmm, reminding us that Jesus, our elder brother and way shower, taught us lessons in truth. And thank you for reminding us 
And he also taught us of our oneness with God. Thank you for reminding us that. Beautiful. Thank you. And now uh, I would like to uh, welcome Reverend Trevay Phillips here, who is going to bless our offering and take care of all that wonderful piece of what we do here in this service. Thank you. Thank you. I can't outgive God. Can you say that, Ruby? I can't, I can't outgive, outgive God. God. You know, the, the prophet says, oh, bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse and prove me now, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not pour out for you a blessing you cannot receive. And Sue Seking from down in Jacksonville, Florida, the Unity Minister, used to say, my cup runneth over and I'm sipping from the saucer. <laughs> and so if we keep that kind of idea in mind that we can't outgive God, but we have to be a part of that flow, that circulation. We give and it comes back to us. So let's take our tithes and offerings, hold them in our hand, and give our blessing to us. Thank you, God, for the abundance that flows into our lives through the multiple channels through which you have to bless us, ways that we have not yet imagined. And so we are open and receptive to all the channels flowing into our lives so that we might give and others may be recipients of our love and be blessed. Thank you, God, and so it is. Amen. hearing the song Lord of the Dance. <laughs> to the offering, I want to uh, remind you that uh, we're going to have a new addition added to this. It looks like they got Mumble laying on the ground out there, maybe starting in the morning uh, to put that together. And we're going to have a patio on this side, I think. 
Uh, we haven't raised all the money for that. So if you happen to be, is that turned around on me? Yes, sir. It is. Is it? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, want to, I want to speak to the audience that's way out there somewhere else. <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to give yet to these projects, we still lack about $1,200 of uh, having enough money to do that patio out there. And so maybe you could uh, send in a few hundred dollars, a few dollars maybe, would help toward that process. So all that's part of the blessing of the offering. Yeah. So <laughs> let's give thanks for all that uh, flows into our lives and for this that flows in and out into this ministry to do its perfect work so that people everywhere might know the truth that sets them free. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Phillips, once again, and everyone else who assisted. So we've come to the uh, place of uh, announcements. And I know that I can't skip over these because Reverend Margaret would not be happy. She once <laughs> made a point of reminding me about that. Uh, first, I want to just start off by saying that um, I just was informed by John Wilder that anyone who is interested in having some bagels, there is apparently an abundance of bagels in the kitchen. Is that correct? They were uh, made by Einstein himself. Oh, <laughs> well. You will understand the general theory of relativity if you eat one. <laughs> this, this is it. So, this is it. How wonderful. I mean, what a blessing. So uh, feel free to stop by the kitchen and get some bagels, everyone. Um, Next Sunday, uh, Reverend David Hiller will be our speaker. Just wanted to let you know that. And the green, the green team, which is doing all the wonderful yard work here, will have an official work day, and it's going to be on Tuesdays. Is that correct, Mary? It will be on Tuesdays at 9.30. You can come at other times, but this is the official day. So uh, please talk with Mary Wilder, John Wilder, Alyssa Ferra. Did I Alyssa pronounce it? Ferrara. Ferrara. I always screw that up, but I want, thank you, okay. Alyssa Ferrara, who is right over here, or Jave Phillips about, about any of these projects. And now that winter is over, we, the grass is growing, and so are all the plants. So we have a lot to do to take care of our beautiful property here. Uh, Unity Outreach. Uh, we do need uh, tutors uh, for students. Let me see if I have some information here about that tells us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the reading tutors for the Boys and Girls Club. Um, they need help for all grades, but particularly the younger kids. Um, uh, apparently, you know, COVID uh, did impact their learning, and uh, so they need some help with their reading skills. And anybody that wants to know more about this, there is a handout in the back. It'll tell you all about it. Please uh, jump in and volunteer and do whatever you can do. And the community, Unity Community Outreach, we do have a list there that talks about what you could uh, donate for help for kids or a helping hand. Did I see Daryl in here? Yeah. Daryl. Is it, hi, hi Daryl. Is there anything that you wanted to add to this or just any, you know, I know you're the, the point person on this. I'm thinking, is there anything I want to add as I walk up here? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, exactly, right. So I can get it, I didn't get the time to turn around and go back. So as you know, at this point in time, Helping Hand is in, you, you can't hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, at this time, Helping Hand is in real need. So what's nice is Helping Hand is now taking clothing, of course. Nice clothing, shoes, jackets, the whole deal. But remember this, it's mostly kids. 
Some of it will be shared with your parents, but it's mostly kids in terms of that, you know, and making sure that the, whatever it is you give, I'll just have to say it bluntly, it's not like cast off and nobody else would wear it again, but stuff that you would want your own grandchildren to wear and have, because really it's about self-esteem and the kids being able to go to school. The second piece is that oftentimes when we give food, it benefits not just the kids, but their parents too. Mm -hmm. So kids get not only food during the week, but on that Friday, a lot of kids, both through Helping Hand as well as through the schools, go home with a backpack that helps feed the family for the weekend. You know, And they do take perishable food now, but you've got to deliver it there, okay? Because they do have freezers for that. So that's, that's, the, that's the main thing. And Helping Hand is doing some of the same thing. They, are ha they have a homeless popula population that they're serving also. And it's adults and kids. And we know everything there is to know in terms of us wanting to make sure that the kids are healthy and safe. That's it. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you very much. And thank you for all that you do and you have been doing for years and years. So I um, appreciate it. Okay, the... Um, prayer box is in the back. Um, if you have any prayer concerns, you can write it down, just leave it in the box, and that will be attended to. The uh, Also, a prayer on Sundays is, is in the Unity House Meditation Room. We have a name for that room now, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> and uh, are you leading that? You know, Reverend Marilyn Maddox does lead that. Now, it says here 10.30 to 10.45, is yes. that the correct time? Yes. Okay, so feel free, any time on a Sunday, come in and you, you certainly can join that group. And I, I know they were in there this morning, well, they're in there every morning that I come here on a Sunday, so that's wonderful. Um, there's a lot of important information on the back table. This is something that, it wasn't listed here, but there are 40 affirmations, a list of 40 affirmations for Lent that you might, uh, it's uh, put out by Unity World Headquarters. And uh, you, you might want to get one of these. Very, very important. I read over them and I think they're very meaningful. So uh, just wanted to share that with you. I think, does anybody else have any announcements or anything? I think I covered Everything on the list here? Okay, good, very good. We have a lot going on here, which is wonderful, really. That, that is wonderful. Um, let's join together with the uh, Unity, updated prayer of Unity. If I can get my page. I'll be very happy to share that with you. We can say that together. It's all right. Here we go. No, here it is. Sorry. Okay. The updated prayer of unity is inspired by James Dillett Freeman's prayer for protection revised by Reverend Margaret Hiller. So, the light of God surrounds us, the presence of God unfolds us, the power of peace protects us and the one presence that lives within all creation enlivens us. Wherever we are, love is, peace is, light is, God is, and all is well. Amen. And now let's end up with the uh, peace song that we sing as a prayer. And remember that you are the light of the world.